Welcome to episode 52, where the Riviera Firefly interviews local entrepreneur Nick Boot and ups its own street cred in the process. Thank you, Nick. Nick and his wife Lisa, they epitomise their home in the sun and the moving abroad dream. After a holiday in the south of France, they saw a sign as they were leaving that said, why not make Provence your home? And this served as inspiration for them to do just that. Learn how, after setting up initially in Navarre, Nick created a niche business and overcame all the paperwork challenges that were thrown at him. UK DJs Abroad is his business and it does exactly what it says on the tin. British beats on foreign streets. Listen in to how he overcame the challenges, how he set a vision for his company and how he's really earning his niche. With hard work, the rewards are there to be had and you can make the Cote d'Azur your home and a place to really tweet home about. You're going to hear about some of the incredible places Nick has gigged at, places that you and I should really go and visit, and what he thinks makes a great event. If you're a local business, do take time to connect with me and Nick on Facebook. We've got lots of interest groups that you can get to via the show notes and also through our website, rivierafirefly.com slash 52. Let's roll. Having successfully launched three businesses, bilingual mum to two and entrepreneur Antonia Bovesan Brown has connected with thousands of people, both French and international since moving to the French Riviera. These connections allow her to speak to successful local businesses and inspirational people about life here on the Côte d'Azur and share it with you. Welcome to the Riviera Firefly podcast with your host, entrepreneur and my mum, Antonia Bovesan Brown. Welcome to the Riviera Firefly podcast to Nick Boot. Thanks, Antonia. You are raising my credibility right now because you're a DJ. Thanks very much. I'd like to <laughs> so, help. We were just talking off air a little bit before about my days back down in Brighton and how it used to be we were out clubbing. We were even members of the Zap Club, which was the coolest club in Brighton at the time. It was an amazing venue. I remember yeah. it well. We probably passed, well, maybe, I don't know, probably passed in the, the couloir or something back in the day. But, I'd uh, imagine so. Good times. Yeah, yeah. I saw him gigging down. Um, it wasn't down at the Zap. It was somewhere further under the arches. Okay. Went to a great gig down there that he did. He's amazing. Every time if you get the chance to see him. It's yeah. incredible. And he, that was when it was quite a small gig. After that, he did the big Brighton things where he took the whole beach over. Yeah, well, that was chaos. No, I've never yeah. went to them, but I um, had friends that went to the second year and it was closed off. And the story I love about that is that absolutely every off-licence and the whole of Brighton had sold out of every bit of booze. <laughs> so every sort of coffee, liquor, or anything like that was gone, the whole lot. I felt I lived my life, you know, in the correct order of like uni, the club scene down there, the escape was another really yeah. great one of ours. And, you know, I, I really worked my 20s hard. Yeah. So I don't have that burning desire to be off down clubbing, you know, from midnight through till six in the morning anymore. I think I did it at the right age. Yeah, likewise. I'm very happy to be behind the decks. Steve, <laughs> now, I'm guessing despite being um, a cool trendsetter down in Brighton, you didn't start off in DJing. But I want to first understand is where have you come from originally? We're thinking UK, but yeah. we'll just double check that. And what brought you to the south of France? So I grew up in Sunny Slough, just outside <laughs> London, and uh, left there to go off to university in Bournemouth. And then after that, moved to London, and my career there was in sales. So I started off selling advertising space. Uh, I was selling adverts in the travel section for the Daily Star. So you can imagine trying to convince somebody to advertise their hotel to Daily Star readers. It was quite a tough sell. So that was a <laughs> baptism of fire. And then worked through different, uh, selling different media, basically, and then the last 10 years I was there, I was selling what's called absence management systems, which are software as a service to help large employers to reduce the amount of spend on, on sickness absence, which uh, is kind of as dry as it sounds. Um, and going along at the same time, I was always DJing since I was about 20 years old. as kind of a, a hobby on the side and throwing little parties. And I was a resident for a night around London for a few years, which was really successful and just amazing fun. So that was really my passion. And then in terms of moving here to France, uh, I've been here for the last almost four years. And what happened was my wife and I had talked for a long time about wanting to live somewhere overseas. She's a real Francophile. She studied French at uni. She'd lived in Paris before and she's incredibly strong willed. So it was her idea to come here. But the thing that really made us want to take the plunge was that we were actually we had a, we had a very dear friend who uh, 
who passed away when we were in London. He took his own life, which was really sudden and tragic, and it really put life into perspective for us. And we were on holiday here in France and had to cut it short to go back for his funeral. And we were walking through Marseille Airport, and there was this enormous sign there with lavender fields, and it said, come to Provence, why not make this your home? And we looked at each other and said, that's not a bad idea. And it really just set the wheels in motion from there. And within a year, we were, we were out here with our eight-month-old son, not knowing anybody in the countryside in Provence, trying to make it work, basically. Wow, wicked story. And it, it makes me think back to our story. It's so similar. It was me that said to my husband, yeah. I think we should go over there. I'd lived abroad in Paris as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I spoke French. He didn't speak any French. So we came here, both of us, with, well, our youngest was nine months. The old one was a toddler. And the same thing, you don't know anyone. And it's a hugely brave step to come over here without your businesses. So you left your your business in sales and yeah. absence management behind. Completely, yeah. I you arrived here on a jet plane. <laughs> yeah, exactly, which was actually cancelled. We'd done this big <laughs> build-up to coming over here and got to the airport and they said, your flight's cancelled. So we started our massive new adventure with 10 hours in Gatwick Airport. And then my wife was on maternity leave at the time, but then quit her job at the end of that. So we both came here really not knowing anybody, not having any business. We'd saved up a bit of money to ensure that we could get through to start with. And our original plan was just, we're going to come for six months, test the water, see how we get on. And we soon realised the money we had would probably last us maybe four or five. And we thought, okay, well, let's see if we can make this work and, and stay. And that's really where the idea for the business, my business came from, UK DJs Abroad because I've always loved DJing, I've always loved music, and I really, at one point, thought, yeah, that's what I'd really love to do in life, but it just didn't really work out like that for one reason or another. And then coming here, I thought, well, I didn't speak a word of French, okay, yeah. and I thought, I need to do something to, um, to really uh, earn some money whilst also having this fresh start to be able to do whatever I want to do, really. And I looked around to see what the DJing opportunities were, and it soon materialised that I think there was a real niche in the market yeah. for English-speaking DJs who offer a real premium service. And that's how it's turned out. So that was four years ago. And after a, only about 10 or 13 gigs in the first year, it's gone up and up and up every year to over 80 last year. And we're on track for over 100 this year. And so UK DJs abroad, it's not just you then? There's Not anymore, no. Yeah. I mean, it's always been called UK DJs abroad. Uh, because it was always the intention of growing it to the point where it's a DJ agency rather than just me. But to start with, I was giving it the royal we, and it was obviously just me. Um, <laughs> I've done that. Before. Well, of course. Make it till you make it, as they say. <laughs> yeah. um, so now we've grown to the point where there's myself, and then I've got another three DJs on the roster uh, who are all English, all great DJs, and they're all they have the same passion like me for music, but not just that for for great customer service and, and really you know, creating a, a great experience for not just your clients but all the other people that, that you're working with because typically the events we do, you have lots of other suppliers there and there's a need to really work together with people and, and put in a, a good shift as well as the glamorous part which is a few hours behind the decks playing the music and getting the dance floor on fire. There's a lot that goes around it so um, I've got some other great DJs that are that share my passion for doing that as well. So it's hugely scalable, which is the key to a great business, Mm -hmm. is that you want something that's scalable. How does it happen? So imagine we've got some DJs, potential DJs listening now, and they're thinking, yeah, cool, I'm going to phone up Nick. What are you looking for in a potential DJ? So somebody that lives here ideally, because at the moment I have one up in Chamonix, one in Nice, and one back in London, and he flies over for the gigs, which is where I first started doing it, and that obviously can bring some complications, not that we can't get around them, but to have somebody that's here, essentially. Um, A DJ that is very happy to play any type of music. You know, when I was playing in clubs in London, it was about what I wanted to play, and people came to hear my music, and I don't take requests, and it's that kind of thing, (laughs) you know, old school. And now, you know, I soon realised... Uh, in order to be a successful business at doing this, we need to be crowd pleasers. So in terms of a decent DJ, I need somebody that is capable in terms of mixing, somebody that creative with what they do. They, they really love the art of mixing and the, the technical side of it, but can transfer that just from not just to club music and house music, but into all kinds of different music because we are happy to play whatever the clients want. So we do everything from Which funk, must be really, disco and pop. must be really hard as a DJ. 
Well, it can be. I mean... Do you get given, like, playlists by your... Yeah, well, we work very closely with each client to understand what they would like, and some people say, right, we've got these 200 tracks, we don't want you to go off that list. We don't want you to go off anything off that list, and that's fine. In my opinion, it doesn't work as well, because you need a little bit of creativity and spontaneity in there Mm. as well, and that's how you get the most out of your DJ. Um, But, uh, yeah, I'm I'm happy to play any type of... uh, any type of music that that people would like, really. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, some people just say, "Look, we'll leave it completely up to you, and here's a few genres that we like and don't like, and then we we build a playlist around that." And there's a huge skill to playlists because I was saying to you just beforehand, I went to a nightclub down on the seafront. It, it's the dream, okay? It's mm-hmm. the thing that you want. It's that social media moment. It's on the beach, your feet. Are, you know, you can be in the sand, the sea, open air, gorgeous. Lovely. But the music, so you're like, oh yeah, top tune. And it's, it will be, it was many years since we'd actually been on a dance floor. Once we'd had kids who stopped going out to nightclubs. So this was our first experience back at, at, at nightclub after the Brighton scene. So the tune comes on and you, you go, yeah, cool. You're down on the dance floor. And then suddenly the next song was a killer, not related at all. There was no like flow. Yeah. It was literally from going from something super dancey to a slow ballad. It was that kind of thing. Right. And everyone kind of, pulls up don't they on the dance floor and they're like oh and and then it dissipates and and they lose it and we never went back there no i'm not surprised well that's that's not a very good dj basically yeah and when it comes to playing from a, a playlist for we do a lot of kind of premium weddings so you have to stick to what the clients want quite often but you get some some leeway in there and sometimes i'll have to put on a song which somebody has requested if it's the bride that's requested and that can sometimes clear the dance floor so what I tend to do in that situation is just if I can see that's happening I just gradually fade that one out and bring the next one in and go straight into one that I know is a tried and tested crowd pleaser so someone planning their wedding right now who's putting together their playlist what's the song they shouldn't have on their playlist what clears the floor uh, it's very difficult to say I mean I try and avoid any song that clears the dance floor of course I don't tend to play slow songs unless unless they're requested. I mean, that to me was, you know, when I was going out clubbing, you didn't suddenly stop to have a lady in red or something like that for, for people doing the slow song. So I avoid that because I'm Or maybe I'm not very fan. late in the night or something. Yeah, like I mean, yeah. it may be something like that. But I, what I'm very keen to do is just build up energy and, and get that, that dance floor just rocking. And so uh, I can't think of anything particularly that's a, that's a particularly bad song that's ever cleared the dance floor. There have been occasions where something's gone on where you've played it the week before and everybody's gone nuts and you play it this time and it's like, oh, that's not had the same effect. But we have loads of international customers, so sometimes that is the challenge in knowing what songs were big in Canada or Australia or maybe Scandinavia that were big tunes in the UK, but maybe didn't come across mm. the way in, uh, internationally. So many of the places that you've been gigging have been gorgeous wedding events. Is there one place that sticks out in your mind as a, gosh, if I could recommend that place for a wedding setting? Yeah. Well, there's all sorts, really, depending upon what you want. There's one that I play at a lot called Chateau de Robernier, which is in Provence, in the, in the Var, which is just this stunning castle I do a lot of gigs there and it's just magical we've got a lovely courtyard with and I we do a lot of lighting as well so we do these festoon lights which are the uh, large bulb string lights that hang overhead and some up lighters and it just creates this beautiful environment um, and that's quite a grand place there's more across Provence which are uh, kind of smaller little uh, domains which are, which are really beautiful for a slightly more intimate wedding if you've got maybe between 60 and 80 people, something like that. There's a place called Domaine de Blanche Fleur, which I like a lot, and I play there. And then there's the more glitzy ones, which are places like Hotel Cap Ferrat, which is just enormously grand with an amazing view out to sea in this beautiful big swimming pool. The last one I did there, they had a lady playing a violin inside a big bubble on the swimming pool and all these grand things like that so I think for anybody that wants to come to the south of France to get married there's everything from Villa Refrussi de Rothschild which is just super grand gorgeous as well really worth a visit absolutely Um, but you need to stick your hand in your pocket to to be able to do that but even if you're working at a lower end of the the budget spectrum there are some beautiful places around as well so and uh, you know we can advise on some of those if anybody wanted to get in touch what you said about lighting it's so important. Like when I when we got married, me and Mr. BB, it was year two thousand, 
and we paid for it ourselves because that was so it just sort of turned at that point where the kids were paying for it themselves because they'd been self-sufficient for that time fine yeah well we didn't have bundles of cash back then so we were like okay um, you know i had my aunts were like doing the flowers uh, someone else was doing this we borrowed glasses from the pub it was marquee yeah. in the garden kind of thing and a hu- 130 people coming cousins okay. were doing food it was it was brilliant it was really good fun and then my uncle, who is into or was into um, sound systems and music, he provided lots of DJ equipment to all the clubs back in okay. England. I'll tell you his name afterwards. Anyway, he said, oh, I'll do the music. And I sort of imagine he'd turn up with a ghetto blaster. Literally, that's what I thought he yeah. would do. But no, he turned up. And the night before, he put a rig up. There was lights. There were smoke machines, the yeah. decks. Well, my vision had been, you know, I was perfectly fine with a from a budget perspective with a ghetto blaster but what he created was this amazing ambiance yeah that just it just blew it away it was incredible it's so important the lighting and those those i, I don't recommend a, a ghetto blaster it's not the way absolutely to go <laughs> no you're absolutely right antonio i think the music and the lighting can play such an enormous part in the success of, of any event the music in particular because you know, we've all been to weddings where it's been a beautiful setting and a lovely ceremony and a nice dinner and then you go to the party and the DJ is not very good and the ambiance isn't great and you think, oh, well, nice day, but a shame, let's go home. And the other ones, what we create is when people come and they say they finish the, the evening with a bang and I've had so many lovely emails back from customers, uh, you know, uh, wedding couples in particular that have said, oh, it just, it just made the whole day and all our, all our guests have been raving around about the whole the whole wedding because of what happened at the end of the night with with a good party and with the lighting you know that can really transform just a basic room into something that just is a really lovely environment which yeah. makes it better for people to enjoy it's themselves. super important i think we so we, as well as that music we had we called them the elvis they were these guys that used to perform down in brighton but two of them elvises you probably don't okay. like elvis presley but anyway so what what happened at the beginning of the wedding is the lights went down and they were flashing on and off. There was smoke and then these two caped guys came on Amazing. and did this performance. And everyone by then, had, you know, a few gins and champagnes into the night. Well, my aunt's coming up going, oh, I've just seen Elvis. Like, it being <laughs> really, obviously they knew it wasn't the real one. But it was just, a, you know, it just created the buzz that you wanted on the night and the music and, and what have you. Completely. And something else that we do is uh, we can perform with saxophonists as well, which gives a really nice bit of theatre to the night as well. Rather than just having somebody behind the decks playing, you can have somebody out there playing sax over the top of the tracks and he just goes in amongst oh, wow. the crowd. And So you've, been ta- you've talked about the weddings, but there's another side to what you do as well. It's the 50th or 40th birthday parties, that kind of thing. Yeah, completely. We do lots of those around for, for private events, uh, corporate events all down in Cannes for all of the big festivals down there. And then one thing that I really love doing is is the private parties for people's birthdays at, at their villa or or something along those lines where we just turn up with a some lighting and, and a sound system and just get the party going there basically. And then nice intimate events. It's a great way to meet people as well. So I, I really love doing those. And you've got to see some of the amazing properties on the Quad Towers, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Some incredible places. It's amazing views and the dream. Having lived in um, the Var or the Provence side and, and now this side, how do they compare to you? What, where did you first start off in there? So we went to a little village called Cotignac, which is kind of middle of nowhere, but actually very cosmopolitan, surprisingly, for a little place. It sounds know. gorgeous. The well, name just sounds lovely. It is. It really is beautiful. And when we first moved from London, we'd come from stressful jobs and we decided we needed the calm life and it was kind of a year in Provence type feeling oh yeah this is the life for us Mm. and that was great for the first year and then the first winter rolled around and it was cold and the heating didn't work very well in the house because they don't in in Provence and so we were just like "Mm, actually we think we might need a a bit more life than this so we moved from there to a bigger town called Brignol which again is not super lively compared to down here but it's sort of uh, you know convenient for for getting around to places Um, and then actually just in the last week we've moved to Mougin here on the Côte d'Azur and uh, we love it already it's just there's just so much to do here so I I think the main difference is um, there's just so much more options we're closer to the sea we're closer to the mountains for going skiing not just uh, being in Mougin but you've got everything close by you've got Cannes and Nice close by and grass so there's just so much more to do here and Mujan and Valbonne and Grasse they're busy in the winter which is kind of a good indicator for, for people looking to come abroad and in our group Cote d'Azur Living there are lots of people that join because 
they're thinking about moving to the Côte d'Azur, they start asking questions about the different areas. And you should come here in the winter. Yeah. Both my wife and I are city people, really. You know, we can, had a go at the countries, countryside living and realised after a short period of time, no, I think we need to be around a lot more life than that. And uh, I think you, you've got, just got everything that, that you need here, really, and you could want for having a, a good life. And tell me quickly about what Lisa's set up. Because you, you came laden with gifts, which, yes. thank you, Lisa, I'm hugely <laughs> appreciative of that. So, yeah, Lisa, my wife, um, well, the first thing to say is she's an absolute force of nature. You know, she, she has totally driven our move here and given me the confidence to, to push on and do set up my business where I never thought that that's something I, I would actually do. So I'm totally indebted to her um, for, for living this lovely life now in, in the sunshine and, and uh, having being my own boss, basically. Um, so her business is called Une Pensée de Provence, uh, which is a pinch of Provence, and she makes beautiful little gift packs, which are um, artisan products from all around Provence, which are things like uh, salts and pastis and honey and lovely little products, which she then uh, buys in bulk and then uh, from, from artisans and then repackages them and designs them beautifully. So you can see those on the website and she does gift packs for uh, wedding gifts or for people that are doing events that want to give them uh, I see them as being great things that uh, when you come on holiday here and you've rented that really nice villa that yeah. that's on your pack completely because it's local yeah. I was watching something on Netflix it was an American thing and they were like trying to jazz up people's home rentals at Airbnbs that kind of thing yeah. and they said something like you should spend 30% or something it was 10 or 30% of that first night spend of your client on pamper gifts for when they arrive. Oh, really? Yeah, it really works in the reviews and everything like that after because people arrive and they're like, oh, this is great, I can put that in my bath tonight or I'll use that special soap or oil or something. So yeah, and it's perfect, the way, it's, especially the way it's packaged up, it's beautiful. Yeah, well, she's just done some new things like she has uh, lavender soap, she's got her own uh, scented candle, which is really nice. So um, I think you're right, it, it's certainly something that she's targeting at the moment, um, not just events, but going out to little private hotels and boutique places like that that might want to give something to their guests. Um, and like you say, I think it's a, it's a beautiful idea. To yeah, is that with a bottle of wine, your guests are going to be really happy. Sorted. Well, she can do that as well. She'll source some lovely local wine for you as well. What have they been the big challenges then in setting up your businesses here in France for you? Well, I mean, for me, the first, the biggest challenge is that I didn't speak the language when I arrived, which is kind of in at the deep end. And you mentioned about the difference between the VAR and here. There, nobody speaks English, really. You, you wouldn't expect to go into a shop and speak anything but French. So that's been a challenge going forward. The best free French lesson, though. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I've had to learn the hard way and I'll get in there with it. Um, so uh, that, that was a challenge to start with. I think anybody else that's ever moved here from England will understand uh, what they call la paperasse, which is the paperwork <laughs> yeah. here. And uh, it's kind of cliche to talk about the red tape here in France, but it's like that for a reason, uh, that it's a cliche, because it's so real. There are just, you know, in England you pay, you pay your taxes, like a PAYE, or you just pay to one organisation. Here it just seems like there are loads of them. And we were totally naive to it when we arrived. Uh, we and again, Lisa does all this. Thank you, Lisa. Um, but sh but we were finding that the that we were getting demands for money in from one organisation. We think right, we'll pay that, and then a few weeks later, you get one from somebody completely different. So getting on top of the whole system there has taken a long time. It's taken because we years. haven't grown up with the acronyms, so we don't know what RS RSI is or, yeah, or CPAM, CPAM or, or yeah. CPAV or whatever they are, and, and so you just see these letters keep coming in on a new headed piece of paper. Yeah, absolutely. So that I mean that was quite scary to start with, to be honest, and we've just about got a handle on it now and got ourselves a really good accountant, so that can, you know, that's really helped us to to pick our way through the minefield. And then I think in terms of uh, other challenges, really the main one is just turning up in a, in a country not knowing anybody at all. When it, when it comes to building a business, um, I've, you know, we've both started from literally from scratch, not knowing a single person, not knowing the industry here, not knowing who we need to speak to about hiring kit or buying kit or uh, how to get into these markets. So for me, because my background was in sales, I'm just not really daunted by picking up the phone to people. And even in this digital age, I've just found there's nothing more 
uh, impactful than getting on the phone to somebody, organising to meet up with them, going out, getting face to face. And that has been the, the main challenge, but it's been overcome just, just by sheer hard work. I'm sure any other uh, business startup or entrepreneur would say the same thing. It's just hard work to, to get yourself off the ground. It's hard picking up the phone. I know, particularly now, people are so used to texting or an email that they're very reluctant to pick up the phone. And the thing is, is actually you get it done faster, probably. Yeah. I'll, I'll probably ignore lots of the emails that come in, mm-hmm. the sales pitches. Whereas if you phoned, I'm more likely to speak to you. It's worth yeah, it. It's worth a punt. Well, and the other thing now is it's kind of uh, it's a bit of a USP because it stands you apart well, from yeah. the fact that most people. I mean, it, it's so much easier to send out an email, and it's. It's easy to sit. There have been loads of times where I've thought I need to send. I'm going to send an email to this person. I think no, I've got to pick up the phone and speak to them if it's a bit awkward or something. And it always comes out better like that. And I think if you can do that when nobody else is doing it, it's just going to stand you apart. And for my business, I said at the start, you know, it. I felt like I found a niche. I think part of that niche was being professional, going the hard hard yards, going and meeting up with people, demonstrating professionalism and, and, and what we can do in terms of going over and above uh, for customer service. And over time, that has really built a, a great reputation for the business. I love that you've mentioned the word niche about three times now yeah. because I've been talking and trying to say to some people that I've been working, auto entrepreneurs with, and I was like, got a niche. This whole sort of, we can serve anyone, the thing is, if you think you can do anyone, no one tags you as the expert. Yeah. Whereas if you niche down, yeah, you say goodbye to some business. Yeah. But then you become the person for, you know, that everyone starts tagging going, oh, yeah, you want an English an English DJ? Where is Nick? Absolutely. You know? And then you're the person that gets tagged all the time, which is, yeah. Well, that's that's been the plan, really, from, from the start. And it's um, it's paid off. You know, I think we've got a good reputation down here now for, for the business amongst... Uh, event planners and wedding planners and uh, now moving to this area very keen to grow that out to uh, sort of a personal network as well it's excellent so what's in line for 2019 well just bigger and better we've got um, more and more events coming on I'm hooking up with more and more event planners that are coming to me for um, for events that they've got on this year in addition to that, as well as growing the number of gigs we're doing, I've grown the roster of DJs and growing the number of services that we've got. So I've just invested in a photo booth. Oh, that's so, so that's much fun. Booth, which is great. It's just a great add-on because yeah. it means that if you're having an event with us coming to DJ anyway, you can have the, the photo booth there right until the end of the night rather than somebody waiting and saying, okay, I need to, I need to go home now, it's midnight. It can just be there until the end of the night. Um, and yeah, it's fun because your guests get a get a takeaway from it uh, as a nice little gift, as a as a memento. We've got some up in our house already from weddings that we've been to in years gone by, um, and it means that the uh, the person that's having the event they can go online afterwards and see all of this stuff, all of the images that have that have taken place in the night. And I know when I got married in particular. I came away afterwards just thinking, I just want to relive every moment of that. I want to speak to everybody about yeah, it yeah. to the point where you're boring people with it. So this just gives another angle of the night where you wouldn't necessarily see what's gone on there, but you just get all these pictures afterwards. I think it's a really, a really nice idea. So yeah, that's something that's going to be uh, available for clients for 2019. <laughs> that sounds a lot of fun. And I've got to say, I'm a fan of the photo booth. I think, yeah, there's my one from the Christmas oh, party. Oh, very nice. <laughs> Uh, what's nice about them is it's not the same as you know when the photographer goes around and there's a place for photo. I'm a real photo person, um, but and everyone poses and does their thing. But in the booth, it's kind of private, so you can do your own silly exactly. poses and things like that. It, it's a great laugh. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think it'll do well. So you've mentioned about coming here and not knowing anyone. What would be your tips for meeting new people? Well, uh, it's hard to say because we've been here for one week <laughs> in uh, Mujan, but for me. Uh, I've been lucky in the job that I do is, is very sociable so I can meet you know up to 100 people at an event and I'm meeting all the other suppliers as well so anybody coming here if you can get into a line of work that is a sociable one that certainly helps um, and other than that I found where we were certainly in the VAR people hear an English accent they're more likely to, to strike up a conversation and also if you come here and just practice your French just throw yourself in at the deep end. I was never bothered about looking silly, about getting it wrong. 
So it just meant that people are more, far more welcoming to you like that and they'll start to chat to you and ask what you do and then they might say, oh, well, actually, I know somebody who runs this business or might like a party. And for me, that's just been able, enabled me to build up a nice network of, of like-minded people that uh, you can either socialise with or, or, or work with. And has it been the same for your wife, Lisa, meeting other people or has it been more school gates or...? Well, um, less about the school gates because our son, Jamie, is only four and he's not been at school uh, for very long uh, so yeah I think I think for her it's just been um, just getting out and about really going out and delivering her products to people and, and meeting people that way and just having the having the courage to, to talk to people in in the street I, I find that people here are actually I mean coming from London where if you even look at somebody on the tube they think that what's that crazy person doing here I think people are actually pretty open you can go and sit in a, in a bar down in Nice and start chatting to people next year I don't think it's seen as something that which is um, which is unusual here so I, I found it quite easy to to meet people here like that so having spent your last four years here would what would you go back and tell your Nick from four years ago before you got on that plane and came out here what would be your piece of advice um, well don't worry about all the paperwork I think is the first thing and I think just just have the confidence to to go and go and just keep pushing because there were times early on certainly where I thought well I, it takes a while to build up a reputation uh, with the business in, in particular because you know you've got to do one gig first before somebody will necessarily book you again further down the line so really just have the confidence to to keep going and, and to keep pushing and just believe believe that this is a life that that you can have because I I never really thought when when Lisa first started saying to me, let's go and live in France, let's jack it all in and go and live there, I, I, we had a long discussions that went on for weeks and months where I just kept saying, we can't do that, people don't do that, surely. And uh, I guess really just to, just to have the confidence to say, yeah, anybody can do it. It's hard, but the rewards are there. If you if you if you take the plunge, you can move away from a life which is, you know, we had a great time in London, but it was getting to the point where we were saying, okay, well we want to change. And for anybody that's thinking, okay, perhaps I should consider doing it then just go for it and just what we always say is there's always a solution to everything we come up against whether it's in our private life here or or in work life that's been a challenge you just got to say there's always a solution and it's it's not a it's not an end it's just a, a learning and a chance to move on to the next thing that's a great philosophy on life and I believe that too is not to don't come up with even with my kids teenagers I'm like, okay, don't come to me with a problem. Come up with some ideas, some some solutions. Sometimes there's more than one. Yeah. And we'll talk through through those. And living and doing the rat race role and job that you've been doing, you know, you could do that, but life's too short. Completely. And being able to sort of get away and see different parts of the world, it's such a great thing to do. Absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, I always said, if you're your own boss, you get to choose what hours you work. And the reality is... You, you just work all hours, in fact, <laughs> you, get, you get to do that. So, I mean, I work crazy long hours at, at doing these events and just all year round, much longer hours than I ever did when I was working for somebody else. But it's for yourself and it's so rewarding to, to be your own boss, knowing that the money that you're making is going into your pocket, what well, the government here doesn't take, of course, um, <laughs> but just knowing that everything that you're doing is, is for building for yourself rather than lining the pockets of, of somebody else that you're working with. Yeah, for. some huge on, enterprise. And obviously, yeah. as you scale up, actually, you'll be able to delegate more and more of the gigs out. That's the plan. I'm Which not getting cool. any younger, Antonio. That's so part of your, doing, your doing the 6am finishes, <laughs> yeah. like, I'm going to start adding on to the youngsters. Yeah, 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 for sure. And actually, you know, I've been doing that here. Uh, there are there are three people now that are starting to take on most of my day to day roles, not all of them, yeah. which is giving me more time to podcast, which is fun because right now that's where my passion is is chatting and meeting people and finding out about their world and then going and seeing the places that they recommend, reading the books that they recommend, that kind of thing. And actually, the people that I've been handing over my role to are enjoying that new challenge. Yeah. So it's a win win. And you Basically. get extra enjoyment from seeing somebody else taking that on and, and doing it on your behalf. Yeah. I mean, it's it's been the scariest thing is taking on other people because, you know, I have been very I've, I've been very careful to ensure that I've built the brand in the way that I want, and that comes down to offering great customer service, as I've said, and to suddenly throw somebody else into the mix to do that and go out on and act on your behalf when the buck stops with you is terrifying to start with, but 
that just comes down to the importance of finding the right people that share your passion for it and, and really want to to deliver the same sort of service and, that you can. And it's the trade-off in delegation, isn't it? Because you have to sort of say, okay, well, I'm trusting you, entrusting you with this role. Yeah. So therefore, you're, you're, you know, I can't then come back in on you going, no, don't do it like this, don't do it like that. Yeah. You've got to kind of then stand back and let them get on with it. Yeah, absolutely. Which is difficult. And, and really, for, for doing events, I have to literally do that because they go off on their own. And, and the reason it's grown is not just because I'm saying, okay, I don't want to do this now. It's because it's got to the point where I'm booked... Well, at least every Saturday of, of last from last year from April to October and many days in between as well. So and obviously most of the events are on Saturdays. So it's out of necessity that I have to have somebody else go and do it. So it's not like I'm even on hand to be able to say, oh, OK, you can do this and that. Because you're busy mixing yeah, your yeah. own somewhere else. Yeah, but I'm, you know, I'm so happy with the guys that I've got on board that, that can do a great job. And I'm you know, happy they'll do as good a job as me when they when they go out. Yeah, well, that's all down in your training and, yeah. and in recruiting. So, um, are you a, a vinyl man or an MP3 man on your time off, your well, days off? Well, I mean, vinyl was where I started. Um, it's not good for your back because having to lug <laughs> around records, uh, but there's just something about the feel of it, which is just, and the, and the crackle, uh, and, and just opening up a record and taking it out of his sleeve. There's just something so lovely about that that you don't get with MP3s. So I went from vinyl onto CDJs, which is you know, playing with CDs, and now onto MP3s. Um, and really, I do get the decks out every now and then to, to play vinyl, but it's just so much more limiting in what you can do. And if I was going out and playing in a club and doing a set, which is what I have chosen, then I could do that. But really going and doing these events where you've got requests from people, you know, I've got a catalogue of seven or 8,000 tracks to draw on, and you just couldn't carry those around. So uh, MP3s is, is just a more practical way. And actually, without getting too technical on it, you can be so much more creative with with MP3s. There's the controllers that you can get now; they just offer you so much more flexibility to be creative in in what you do. So I'm I'm a big fan of those as well. In fact, in the DJ world, there's a big debate around whether people are proper DJs if they have these controllers because some of it's automated. But for me, if it allows me to do more and offer a better performance, then I'm all for it. It's funny, isn't it? Because um, my son, he's got the new, you'll know the proper word for it, the, what are they called, the iPhone ear? Oh, yeah, the uh, earpods. Yeah. So we don't actually hear any of his music, uh-huh. which is kind of weird, right? Because you yeah. expect teenagers to be pumping it out. But no, yeah. he, that's all in his own world. Our younger daughter, she had a crazy list for her birthday of what okay. she wanted. And I was like, no way, you are not having this. No, <laughs> didn't agree with it. And I don't, oh, and then my mum and dad were clearing out their cab and handed me back some of my old vinyl from my albums from when I was about 16, 17 years old. Didn't even know they still had them. Oh, amazing. No, I'm not proud of many of them, but so the Prince one <laughs> I was kind of proud of. And anyway, so I had this and then I, the, the record player that I'd bought in an old truck, it didn't work. It plays it at the wrong speed. We tried to fix it, couldn't get it fixed. So I thought, oh no, for her birthday, instead of this thing that she wants, I'm going to get her a record player. Mm-hmm. So a really cool little record player. She has not been off it. Really? Not been off it. Considering that she's got the same iPhones and all that and speakers and headphones, she just loved playing my old vinyl and all these old records and and some of my mum's old ones like Tina Turner and, you know, stuff that she would never be looking at normally. She's there with her. and, And the experience of just putting the needle on. Yeah, there's something that's a lot more satisfying about that and actually going and buying records because... When I was doing that, I'd be saving up money to go out and spend 50 quid on my, on my records for the month or something when <laughs> I was starting out. And now, 50 quid, you could, you could download 50 tracks. And the problem with that is you kind of get... There's just so much more available. I mean, I, I heard a quote from Niall Rogers the other day who said apparently there are 100,000 new tracks released every week now. So wow. there's, just, there's just too much there. Whereas in those days, I'd have to really pour over the records to say, okay, I'm only getting seven, eight records this time around and you've got to really make sure they're right and so you really cherish those and now it's a bit more, like modern society I suppose it's a lot more throwaway yeah, yeah. and there's something as a DJ as well about sort of rifling through what record you're going to play next and, and seeing the album cover and that evoking something about whether you should play it or not rather than just looking at the name on the screen there's something a lot less mm. uh, enjoyable about that side of it but really, you know 
being on the professional side of things, it's just much easier really to, to do it with uh, with the MP3s now. But it's great that I know there's a there's a uh, there's a real revolution for vinyl now, so it's amazing. Well, there's a vinyl fair in Antibes this weekend actually, oh, and really? if I can drag my daughter away from her revision for her brevet, we might go down. <laughs> it's second hand vinyl. Oh, where so thought, is that? Uh, down in Antibes. I'll look it up. I can't remember exactly. I'll send I'll send it to you. Oh great! I'd love but to see um, that. I just thought it might be fun to take her down and let her choose her own ones so when you're not busy on the decks on the mp3 what do you call it when it's on mp3 is it still on the deck it's on the deck so it's called a controller but that doesn't sound doesn't too sound sexy, as cool. does it? so uh, we say i just say on the decks yeah. <laughs> when you're not on there are you a reader do you, you know to pick up a book yeah I, I mean i actually listen to a lot of podcasts because i spend a lot of time in the car and we've recently got a dog or in the last year so i'm out walking him <laughs> quite a lot um so i listen to a lot of podcasts so but when i do get the chance to read yeah i love all kinds of different books um, the one that we were talking about just before uh, we came on air was one called Irresistible, which I really loved. It's about the rise of addictive technology and things like uh, how Instagram and computer games and even Netflix are designed to keep you addictive. And it's it's a real problem for, for people now that they can be addicted to these things. I and mean, we've all seen it. We're all guilty of it, spending too long on our phones. But it's just a really interesting read about how businesses are actually uh, building this technology specifically to be addictive and it's interesting you hear um, that Tim Cook who's the CEO of Apple doesn't allow his kids to have iPads, the uh, the designer of Minecraft doesn't allow his kids to play it because there are downsides to these things so um, that was a really fascinating book that, uh, that was a lot well, Okay I'll put that in the show notes because a book that I read a couple of years ago in book club was called The Circle which is now a okay. film with Tom Hanks in uh, it's not particularly well written, but the concept, it's sort of Facebook meets Google and it's this whole world of how we all need likes and we're posting things for likes yeah. and um, we're asking for feedback. And if you don't give five out of five, you're going back to the client saying, why didn't you score me five out of five? Yeah. Could we up to five out of five? And I think Black Mirror on Netflix yeah. did a bit along those lines. Absolutely. Black Mirror is just genius. It I, really there's, is, there's yeah. that one episode there where they everybody's getting uh, a score from every interaction. So you go yeah. and buy coffee and the guy who you bought coffee yeah. from gives you a score about how nice you are. So everybody's just living by these standards and being fake. And it's it's obviously something which is dramatised and in the future, but it's a really, that programme's amazing. It's a believable right? future. Absolutely. That's the thing. Yeah, All the black yeah, mirrors, they're scary to watch. They're uncomfortable to watch. Yeah. Because I think they're so believable. Yeah, indeed. And what the beauty of Netflix, like we were saying earlier, is you don't have to get up and change, it just plays the next one. Exactly. So we're hooked in and we're sucked in, which is why you said that book. Yeah, and also <laughs> the uh, the way that, it's not just the technology now, but the way that the um, the series are being made is that they always start off slow and then they build to a crescendo that gets to the end of that. So you're like, oh no, I need to, I need to watch it. You're left on a cliffhanger. I've got to watch the next episode. So in this book, their recommendation is you watch you start off a series by watching one and a half episodes and then you always watch the second half and the okay. first half so that you don't get stuck into and it brings you patience thing because our kids are going to grow up not needing patience because they don't have to save up 50 quid to go and pour over which vinyl to buy they're just downloading it or they maybe have their parents nicely doing apple music or something like that yeah where they just get it instantly. They're able to watch the series they want. They go to YouTube whenever they want and every question is at their fingertips. We're in our house, we have, I have, this rule where you're not allowed your phone at the table. And my husband, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. BB IT man, he, he loves to fact check as soon as something comes up in discussion. Straight away, yeah, you two would get on really well actually. <laughs> Gets his phone out straight away and I'm like, no, because then we're setting a precedent yeah. where we're saying to the kids, don't get your phone out. Yeah. But we can because we're fact checking. Well, where's that line? So we were having a big discussion, in a healthy discussion, in our house the other day about that. Yeah. Well, there's another great book, which is, is really heavy going, actually. So I've not actually finished it yet, but it's called Homo Deus. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. But it's talking about the future of mankind. And they're saying about how uh, the, in the future, people have seen like, people turning into robots. And that all sounds so far-fetched, but saying, you know, you've got things built into your, your hand. Mm-hmm. But, but really, the phone is glued to everybody's hand now that's what you use for for getting information for doing everything that you want to do it's almost a part of us already so they're talking about how there'll be more and more things with wearable technology how 
we are becoming more kind of robotic in certain ways like that which is uh, for sure and scary. even the apple watch is already an extension of that it's a smaller getting down to the chip size yeah and the, and the google glass yeah. where you can record everything and so yeah it's uh, interesting times ahead i think it's going to be challenging for the next generation you know what's so funny is when i was working in amex i was working in smart chip technology that was my last job there so this is going back i guess 17 years now ish no 16 years and our boss gave me and my one of my colleagues this smartphone and we had to go home to our house like our respective houses and facetime each other except that, that word didn't exist then yeah so we had a call looking at each other and we were just laughing we're like why would anyone want to do this yeah, it, it was the bizarre. weirdest thing and they were talking even back then about putting chips in key fobs so that when you went to pay for your petrol you took your key fob out and you just wave it at the machine okay. proximity payments and stuff like that yeah. and again people are like but I'll just use my credit card yeah. and look how it did, you know it's taken a bit longer maybe to get there but but I mean, I'm an absolute technophile it's part of my job to, to love yeah. the technology, so I'm really interested in it all. And I think uh, harnessed the right way, it can offer us obviously so many positives, but there there is just such a downside to it potentially of uh, the addictive side of it, definitely. In fact, I'm going to try something right now. So if I say, Alexa, play the Riviera Firefly podcast, I wonder if people's Alexas are going to switch on <laughs> yeah, and doing it. Because we've just added it in. So, uh, oh, really? I've I... just got an Alexa, actually, <laughs> so that's, uh, I'll try that one. Mine got stolen from me in the airport in, you know, in the baggage control. I just oh, bought yeah. one in England. Hadn't even got it out of the box and it got stolen um, oh, no, somewhere. No. Yeah. But I'm kind of glad. I sort of think, okay, fine. We don't have Alexa listening right now. But anyway, hopefully Alexa is playing the Riviera Firefly podcast everywhere. Indeed. In, in, in uh, stereo now. Leave us with an inspirational quote and then tell us how people can get in contact with you. Of course. So um, an inspirational quote I like is by Henry Ford. So maybe somebody said this on the podcast before because it's quite a famous one, but it's, and I'm paraphrasing, if you believe you can do something or you don't, then you're right and it's one that I guess I think about a lot because uh, having that confidence to go on and do the next thing, I have to constantly go back and say, yeah, if you believe you can do this, then then you're halfway there, basically. So that's that's a, a quote that's really stood me in good stead over the last few years being here. I love it. That's a nice one to write down, actually, and have visible. I, I do. Think. I yeah. have it at home, yeah. How can people get in contact with you, Nick? So you can go onto our website where there's all the contact details, which is ukdjsabroad.com. We're on uh, Instagram and Facebook at, at uh, ukdjsabroad.com. Uh, and if they wanted to give me a call, I'm very happy to have a chat with everybody as well, but you can get my contact details uh, on the website. Perfect. So available for weddings, bar mitzvahs, the 50th lots, the, the whole lot. Yeah, any events that, uh, that you need, the dance floor on fire and some good quality sound and lighting and the photo booth and then get in touch. Yeah, and une pensée de Provence for all those gifts in the uh, Airbnbs, hotels, boutique hotels. Brilliant. Absolutely, or if you're having an event, if you're having something at your villa and you want to have a little gift for everybody, then uh, you can find details of that on une pensée de Provence.com. Well, Nick, thank you very much for helping me with my street cred. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been an absolute (laughs) pleasure, Antonia. The Riviera Firefly podcast appreciates every contributor and listener. Your comments, likes and shares make us really happy and inspire us to keep doing the shows. Come join us in our free community groups on Facebook, Côte d'Azur Living, for all things south of France. And for those running a business, you need to join the Riviera Firefly business cocoon. It's totally free. The costs of producing and hosting this podcast are funded by Kiddyland. Nicknamed by their clients the Little English School, they organise fun activities all in English for 0 to 16 year olds from baby clubs and playgroups to English lessons and holiday camps. They even hold workshops for adults too, right here on the Côte d'Azur. You can find out more about Kiddyland directly on their website www.kiddyland.com. So thanks for listening. Please do pay it forward and share an episode so we can spread the cut as your love. Until next time, Fireflies, au revoir.